Thank you for that lovely performance by uh, the Kadaf dancers. Now we have uh, Dr. Paul Kardlich who is joining us via Zoom. His session is on how great was Alexander son of Philip. Um, I don't... Can you put him on screen please? Um, Dr. Paul Kardlich was educated at Oxford University, taking his double first in classics at New College. He took his um, doctor's in philosophy and classical archaeology and history in 1975. And he has worked on uh, early Sparta from 1950 to 650, sorry, 950 to 650 BC, and archaeological and historical studies. Dr. Paul, um, Dr. Paul Carthage unfortunately could not be with us here today, but he has joined us, and his abstract and bio is on the screen for you to see. He will be giving us a session, as I said before, on how great was Alexander son of Philip. I hope you enjoy.
Okay. Uh, just wanted to welcome Dr. Paul Kaslich to our uh, session here today. So sorry for the delay, but we have him now. Uh, welcome, Dr. Paul Kaslich, to the conference on Alexander and Janine Stali. Can you hear us? Dr. Kaslich, can you hear us?
uh, to Paul Kastich at the moment. But for now, we're going to have uh, Dr. S.S. Sajjadzadeen Sahab. Um, I invite S.S. Sajjadzadeen Sahab to the stage. He's going to introduce him. who benefited from them, the study of Roman law, for which to me was a direct aftermath of that first step taken by a Roman soldier. And today, in many visible and intangible ways, the impact of uh, Alexander's brief incursion into our side of the Punjab and the Sindh has had lasting consequence. Well, who was Alexander? Was he what we are led to believe, this rather glamorous young man 
um, or was he this? And this is probably the closest likeness we've got to him, and it comes from a, um, uh, it comes from the um, uh, mosaic that was found in Pompeii, and it showed him, and it's as good a representation of Alexander as, pos as um, we could find. Alexander's popularity remained throughout the centuries. The 16th century Italian painter, Veronese, painted an unusual composition showing Alexander receiving the submission not of Darius, but of his family. And the drama is heightened by the suggestion that Darius's wife mistook Alexander's um, companion, Hephaestion, the taller of the two, for Alexander. Again, in the 19th century, one is not surprised to find Alexander, and now we're talking about almost 2,000 years after his death, Alexander in full dress uniform, uh, a painting done in the Kangra Hill State. This is in the north of the Punjab. What was it about Alexander that even the Russians, the Tsar of all Russias, adopted his name? And here is the third of them, Tsar Alexander III, who died in 1894 and was then succeeded by his son, the ill-fated Alexander uh, Nicholas II. Even Mumbai's hot Bollywood succumbs to Alexander's charms, and here we have the founder of the Kapoor dynasty, Prithviraj Kapoor, as an Indian, they see Alexander. But Hollywood couldn't be far behind, and so we have Richard Burton dressed up as Alexander, and more recently, in a rather prettified version of Alexander, we have Colin Farrell. Most recent reconstructions, though, of Alexander's are based on ancient statues purported to be of him. He was quintessentially a Macedonian, just as Jesus Christ was genetically a Middle Easterner. So neither of them was a white Anglo-Saxon, which is what we, lead, we are led to believe. They were both basically Middle Easterners or Arabs. This is probably the closest modern re uh, reconstruction to what Alexander must have looked like. Well, we've, we've gone by the visual images, but what about the literary sources that we have about Alexander? There are a number of um, sources which have been identified by a number of scholars, and we have Dr. Sturman here. Because when we come to uh, his reconstruction from uh, the records, they've relied upon records that were left, but which were compiled many, many years after his life. And some of the most prominent have been identified by Dr. Richard Stoneman. One, for example, Ariane. A second, Quintus Curtius Rufus. A third, Plutarch. A fourth, the history of Diodorus by the him, the Sicilian, and the fifth, uh, a little more complicated, but compiled from the universal history of Trogus Pompeius. Dr. Stoneman, Stoneman, in his book, mentions some who accompanied Alexander on his expedition. So these are more reliable for being contemporary to Alexander's uh, expeditions. One, Charles, two, Medeus, and then Polycletus and Ephiphus, and Callisthenes, who was Aristotle's nephew, and the fourth, sorry, he was regarded as one of the most important. The, so who was Alexander, um, uh, sorry, who, who, it was perhaps at this time, it'd be nice to celebrate the recent publication that has come, a reprint that was done by EFT of uh, Egremont, and I think most of the scholars have found a copy of it in their folders. So who was this man, this Macedonian phenomenon, who lived for only 32 years, but in that short span managed to expand his empire from Macedonia and Egypt into the west to the border of our Indus? How did this hyperactive hero spend the last 12 years of his life tramping with his army over 22,000 miles. As a conqueror, 
Alexander left his legacy throughout the empire, specifically in 22 cities which were named after him. Julius Caesar managed the building of the Forum Millennium and rebuilding two city-states, and he named neither after himself. But Alexander, according to Plutarch, named 70. Others have scaled that down to 20. But the first of the many Alexandrias that we know of in the far east of the Macedonian Empire was in Afghanistan. It would be tempting to talk about Alexander's conquest before he turned eastwards towards India. The paucity of information available to conquerors, whether crossing the continents over land or using sea routes, is apparent in this medieval map of Asia, drawn by Munster in 1486. The run of Kutch, as you see, is given as much prominence as the entire peninsula of India. So why did Alexander turn towards the east? As Mr. Stoneman, Stoneman has suggest, Dr. Stoneman has suggested, it has been for some time part of Alexander's plan to conquer India. It was here that his pothos, his yearning, came into full play. The geographical conceptions of the time made it possible to believe that India represented the last land before the encircling ocean. So the invasion of India would constitute in the conquest of the entire world to the east of Greece. As you'll see, Alexander never invaded all of India. India, what is shown on this map, as India intra Gangem, which means within the Ganges. He stopped short at the Indus, which appears as a blue line flowing from the north to the Arabian Sea. I've marked them in blue. Alexander and his army crossed the Hindu Kush in spring 327. The army consisted of between 30,000 and 120,000 warriors, of whom only 15,000 soldiers were Macedon, were, uh, uh, of which only 15,000 were soldiers, and about 2,000 were cavalry. The rest were conscripts, camp followers, and Persian recruits. They crossed the Hindu Kush by the Selang Pass and in 10 days, and from there they made their way more easily into the Khyber Pass and into the Indus Plain. He had been, Alexander had been in Afghanistan for almost three years, the longest stay in any place in his campaigns. In autumn 327, Alexander made a detour into Swarth to subjugate the local tribes, and there he encountered the Kafirs, and you've seen the descendants of some of them dancing here, and there, whose physical similarities to the fair Greeks have led to much scholarly speculation. In 326, Alexander advanced to the Indus the university town of Taxila lay en route, and he crossed the Indus using a bridge of boats, made, a bridge using, um, made from boats tied together. And it was here, just in front of, beyond Taxila, that he encountered a herd of elephants which had been left behind by the retreating army. Of all the adversaries Alexander fought, none has shared the Alexandrian folklore as the local Paravan ruler, Porus, whose lands between, lay between the Jhelum and the Chenab. Who doesn't know that the wounded Porus' famous retort to Alexander and Alexander's response after he defeated Porus? He made Porus richer in defeat than he ever was as a king, restoring his kingdom and adding seven new tribes and 2,000 new cities to Porus's kingdom. Inevitably, coins were struck to commemorate Alexander's victory over Porus and his novel weaponry are trained elephants. When Alexander's famous horse, Bucephala, died in battle, he was buried by Alexander on the banks of the river, Jhelum, and a city was named after him, and you can see that ringed in red. I've also put in here, it ringed again, Agrophagi, which in this map, in Latin, stood for persons who ate agriculture, who were agriculturists. And I'll come to the word fagi a little later. For any doctors in the audience? None? Oh God, but don't have a heart attack. Huh? You are? What does the word fagi stand for? Fagi. Now, esophagus, what does that mean? Okay, it means ingesting, all right? So here, I don't want to eat any. Agrophagy means a, a tribe 
that is dependent upon agriculture. It was in Punjab that Alexander was confronted by a mutiny amongst his troops. Tired of constant marches and battles, they refused to cross into India. For once, he agreed to be led by his army and not lead them. He changed course and traveled down the Indus. Alexander encountered his next adversary, the Malloy, whose base was Multan. He took the unprecedented risk of storming the capital, the citadel, alone. And although seriously injured, he fought while rescued by his own troops who climbed a dangerously um, insecure ladder. And when he, somebody, one of the historians commented, it's for heroes to do good deeds. To understand the stamina of the troops who accompanied him, one has to remember that each soldier carried almost his own weight in arms on his body. And this gives you an idea of two of the kind of soldiers that he would have ha had. To navigate the Indus, the entire fleet was built by Alexander's engineers and was said to be two months using local timber. Included were flat bottom boats for the horses, 30 old aircraft for the officers, three banked triremines, circular tubs, and 80 huge grain lighters for suppliers. So you can imagine the logistics involved for moving down the Indus. Robin Lane Fox, in his wonderful biography of um, uh, Alexander, Robin, uh, yep. the he mentions the splash of the oars was unprecedented, as was the shout of the coxes who gave orders for the rowers to take each stroke. The banks of the river were higher than the ships and enclosed the noise in a narrow space so that it was magnified and re-echoed from one side to the other. Wonderful image of these true boats going down and the splashing of the oars reverberating on the banks of the Indus. A novel method was the use of inflated buffalo skins filled with hay. And this remained in use even into the 19th century when the British needed to cross rivers in India. It took the fleet seven months traveling down the Indus. Alexander Burns, for example, in 1834, took only 15 days. By 1725, 325, Alexander had reached Patala near the southern coast. So why did Alexander decide to take the predictably hazardous overland route instead of accompanying his admiral, Nyakos, and follow the sea route? Nyakos was right later that Alexander was all too aware of the hazards and feared meeting a bare stretch of the country or failing to find anchorage. But even so, his desire was to do something that was always new and triumphed over his fears. At this stage, Alexander was leading a large army which consisted of about 30,000 fighting men and um, 8,000 of whom were Macedonians. He had released half of their foot companions earlier, many of whom returned home. Traveling by day and by night, uh, sorry, traveling by night and then suffering by day, the Harris soldiers kept as close to the coastline as possible and struggled to find water. Arian makes clear in his explanation of the commissioning of Inyarkas' voyage, as um, Dr. Stoneman has said, told us, from a desire to explore the, explore the whole coastline along the route, to gather information about all the coastal settlements and find out what was, land was fertile and what was desert. This particular map of the southern coast, coastline was made by an English seafaring captain, Sir Robert Dudley. But the reason I've included it is that each of the small ports where fresh water was available along the southern Makran coastline right, was marked. And this was for use by future seafaring captains. And the arrow points to Sea Cape Krosh, perhaps the earliest reference we have to Karachi port. This Ptolemaic map by Giacomo Gestaldi and printed in 1548 shows the area west of Makran. The vignette is of special interest. The local population of the ancient Makranis subsisted entirely, according to the accounts that we have, of, on fish. The Greeks called them ichthophagi, rather like the agrophagi. You had the ichthophagi. Ichthi stands for fish, 
and Fagus means eaters of fish. They were described by Ariane as inhospitable and thoroughly brutish. They allowed their nails to grow from birth to old age, and they left their hair matted. Their skin was scorched by the sun, and they dressed in pelts of wild animals, even of large fishes, and they lived off the flesh of stranded whales. Finally, in the autumn of 325, Alexander, after putting his troops through unbearable rigors for 60 days, led them to Kirman, Carmenia in Persia. You can see it marked on in yellow. It is said that if 40,000 people had fallen into the desert, not even the sum total of all the army's sufferings in Asia deserve to be compared with the hardships in Makran. This Makran episode proved to his troops that their leader, Alexander, proved fallible, however forceful his pretensions were to being treated as a god. Alexander was 31 years old when he arrived in Persia. It was an age when most of us begin our careers. Alexander has reached the borders of my narrative. He remained the remaining two years, spent the remaining two years of his life enjoying a sybaritic existence with wine, women, and Hephaestion. Coins bearing his profile with the diadem and the horns of the gold Zeus Ammon, God Zeus Ammon, continued to appear posthumously, reinforcing his reputation of being superhuman, a neo-divinity. Alexander died in Babylon on the 10th of June, 323 BC. Unlike the Egyptian pharaohs, Alexander did not have time to prepare his own sarcophagus nor his tomb. His mummified body was repatriated to Greece where it was hijacked and taken to Egypt, first to Memphis and later interred in Alexandria. This sarcophagus, a later version, is almost as good as, to, as the, the one that he was interred in. And it'll give you an idea of what his tomb must have looked like. Alexander's name continued in oral and in written traditions. And here you can see in Persia, Dasan goes narrating the story of Alexander Iskandar Bacha. Greek influence, culture, and remained. And what better examples than Ganaran sculpture itself? We see these statues in isolation of their original settings and therefore cannot admire fully the brilliance of the sculptors who fashioned them. Here you have the goddess Hariri. Similarly, we see Alexander as a historical figure, a man, not the military genius, inspiring leader and compassionate commander and ultimately kingmaker that he became. Alexander died, as I've said, comparatively young. But as he said of himself, I do not count my years, I count my victories. I cannot improve upon Robin Lane Fox's closing remarks about the legacy of Alexander. He wrote, within five years of Alexander's death, his Asian successors gathered near Persia as if to discuss their differences. They could not be brought so much as to sit together until the suggestion was made to congregate in Alexander's royal tent, where they could talk as equals before Alexander's scepter, his royal robes, and his empty throne. Neither they nor anyone since has been able to fill the space in history left by Alexander the Great. So let me now invite two of the eminent scholars that we have here who've both written on Alexander, Robin Lane Fox and Dr. Richard Stoneman. No, 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 we have Paul Cartridge first. Ah, sorry, I've been told that Dr. Paul Cartridge is on the line, so we go back to where we began. Thank you very much indeed. We have Dr. Paul Cartledge online finally now, and uh, he will be talking, I will just read it out again. Uh, his 
talk is on how great was Alexander, son of Philip. He will be starting right about now. Thank you. Can anybody hear me in the hall? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency's colleagues, friends. Greetings from a wet Cambridge, England. First of all, many congratulations to the organizers of this fascinating conference, and many thanks to them for inviting this 20-minute presentation from me, by no means a world expert in this field, and many apologies to them and to my fellow participants and to our audience for being unable to be present in person in Karachi. I much enjoyed Dr. Ayazuddin's talk just now. Thank you so much for that. It's been well said that we all have the Alexander of our dreams or nightmares. One hint of our attitude towards him can often be given by what we choose to call him. As someone once said, some are born great, some achieve greatness, but few are deemed so great that they actually have greatness hardwired into their given name, as does our Alexander. Hence, anticipating the Francophone Charlemagne, the Greeks speak of Mega Alexandros. What of my own attitude, my preferred nomenclature? In my book of 2004, inevitably, I called him Alexander the Great, though, as we all know, in one not unimportant sense, that's grossly anachronistic, because he wasn't so labeled until possibly some time after his death. For today's purposes, I have deliberately titled my little talk differently, Alexander, son of Philip and not, say, Alexander III, King of the Macedonians. Because that was how he styled himself when he wanted to present himself plainly to the Athenians in 334 BC, BCE, as just another Hellene, rather than as their alien overlord and master. And in assessing his greatness, I'm interested in his self-presentation, as well as in how he's been received and perceived by others, including ourselves. This is hardly an original topic, I confess, but I believe it's acquired a particular salience quite recently. Alexandrian poet C.P. Kavafi famously picked up on that self-description of Alexander in his own poem, In the Year 200 BC. Quoting from the text that Alexander ordered to have a company, a dedication of captured arms and armor that he sent back to Athens after his first winning battle at the Granicus, 334, Kavafi fastened on the three Greek words meaning except the Lacedaemonians, the Spartans. Alexander's point was to denigrate the Spartans, who, though they were Greeks, they'd had no part in his ostensibly pan-Hellenic campaign. Kavafi, no less of a pan-Hellenist than Alexander, was making a different point, that Alexander's world, the Hellenistic world that Alexander did so much to create, was far broader far more diverse and inclusive than the Spartan's narrow-mindedness could begin to encompass. That brave new worldview, too, is very relevant to, to any estimate of Alexander's greatness, as I hope we'll see. My point, my opening point, is, however, rather different again. It is that Alexander was not any one single person or personality. Rather like Walt Whitman, he contained multitudes. There have been, there are many Alexanders, not just the one. 
He meant or means one thing to Greeks or some Greeks, another to his non-Greek subjects, and he has been and is differently configured in Egypt as a pharaoh or Persia as a great king of kings or some sort of nabob perhaps or sultan in what is today your Pakistan and so on. And that's to take account only of his own day and the immediately succeeding period. The various medieval European Alexanders or the Alexanders of the Islamic world, these are different again. As the, there has been very recently an exhibition in London at the British Library and that made that point extremely well and clearly. So it's within that context or contexts, my question, how great was Alexander, has to be addressed. The problematic, if I may put it this way, is not simple. It is very problematic. For well, greatness, however defined, must inevitably be to some extent subjective in the eye of the beholder. From another point of view, one of the several issues that the very category of greatness raises is ethical, namely the relationship between greatness and goodness. Do great men and women have necessarily also to be good people, or at least to achieve some morally good outcome or outcome? It's complicated, and a cursory survey of historical figures who have lastingly attracted the moniker the Great, Emperor Constantine, Pope Gregory, Empress Catherine, suggests that the answer is no, no, not at all. It's not necessary for someone to be great, for them to be good. A couple more preliminaries, and if I may, as with our previous speaker, we must begin with the sources. The reliable, usable, contemporary evidence for what Alexander did, let alone why he did it, is nugatory, um, very, very uh, slight and poor. Robin Lane Fox's splendid first book, and this year, by the way, is its golden jubilee, opens by making that point very, very clearly. There is some contemporary archaeological evidence that's relevant. There are some relevant contemporary Greek and non-Greek uh, written documents, but they take us only so far, and that is not very. There is some relevant, as I say, contemporary evidence, <clears throat> but for a, even a bare outline of the narrative of his short reign, we rely chiefly, notoriously, on a work of something like history, written well over 400 years after Alexander's death in 323 BCE by Arian, Arianos of Nicomedia in Asia Minor. And when it comes to Arian's interpretation of that narrative reconstruction, we have to, as it were, hold our noses as he reveals the identity of his two preferred main sources, contemporary eyewitness written sources, both of them more or less malodorous. My final preliminary point. What follows is therefore a talk about reception, about how Alexander's been portrayed and perceived, what the Greeks would have called his doxa, as much as or more than about what he actually did or in some objective sense achieved, what the Greeks would have called his erga. Now I'm going to operate obviously with the Tolstoyan binary war and peace, but I have to say at once that in his case the category of peace is small to the point of uh, evanescence. From the age of 16, when, in his father's absence, he assumed the role of regent and promptly subdued a local people and renamed their capital after himself, Alexander was hardly ever at peace, nor was he ever a man of peace. Indeed, 
Since it seems that at the time of his premature death, aged late 32, nearly 33, he wasn't intending to settle down any time soon, it's probably fair to say that so far from being a man of peace, he acted always on the Ciceronian maxim. If it's peace that you want, prepare to go to war, which is where I go next. As a general, as a commander of men on the field of battle, indeed on an extraordinary diversity of fields of battle, Alexander was and is almost non pareil, almost in a class by himself. At any rate, he's right up there with, well, whom? Uh, Julius Caesar, the first Duke of Marlborough, Napoleon until the Battle of Borodino, or Genghis Khan? Perhaps. Certainly. He was superior to a couple of people who've had the conqueror tagged on to their given name, such as the Ottoman Mehmet II, or our very own, I mean our British, uh, Duke William I of Normandy. It's been instead indeed that Alexander was a military Midas. He turned everything, well, almost everything that he touched, militarily speaking, to gold. Yes, in a decade of conquering, he, or rather a subordinate or two of his, did suffer some reverses. Yes, subduing Afghanistan, as our previous speaker said, took him far longer than he'd anticipated or intended. And yes, there were Iranian tribesmen whom he never subdued, but against those negatives has to be set a whole glittering array of pluses, four victories in major set-piece battles, all in more or less unfamiliar terrain, two against totally unfamiliar types of opponents or armaments. Away from set-piece pitched battle, one of the several military attributes he owed ultimately to his father was expertise in siege warfare. It's he, rather than Demetrius, who deserves to be known as the Polyochetes, or the besieger. Two of his successful sieges were quite exceptionally demanding of quite exceptional resource and determination, as well as personal leadership and bravery. I could go on, as of course Alexander hoped he would, ever further east, until he suffered a major non-military defeat at the hands of his own striking troops. And as he seems to have been planning to continue to go on after returning to what's today Iraq and getting first the Arabians and then, who knows, the Carthaginians in his sights. But now it's at this point that we have to ask, what's it all about, Alex? Why this seemingly insatiable passion of yours, this pothos for ever grander scale conquest? Cui bono? For whose benefit? Was it solely or principally for you to gratify your superinflated ego and desire for Kleos, fame, that this vast Asiatic expeditionary project was mounted? It's a separate question, of course, whether anything bonum, good, actually eventuated from it, for others as well as for Alexander, for his immediate subjects and for later inhabitants of his very brief empire, whether any good consequence or consequences were intended, of course, or not. To that I'll return at the end of this talk, but first, however much it may amaze us or stick in our craw if you're not so fond of him, we have to take some account of the Alexander myth or the Alexander legend as that ramified over the centuries, both east and west, following his death and after the frankly dismal two generations long period of power seeking intestine warfare between his successors. 
The exhibition at the British Library I mentioned earlier that Richard Stoneman had such a major part in, and there's a wonderful catalogue which Richard has edited, is subtitled The Making of a Myth. For the ancient Greeks, a muthos was a traditional tale, often but not necessarily religious, about some personage or some concept or ideal of transcendent importance to wider society, so important that it was literally handed down over the generations, being remolded or remodeled and acquiring accretions or losing features in accordance with changing social and societal needs. Alexander was just such a muthos, much more so in that ancient Greek sense than he was mythical in our modern sense, which means basically unhistorical or legendary. Yet it's of course in that latter sense that his fame, his myth, has been mainly spread since antiquity through medieval Christendom and the Islamic world, right down to the very different, crucially post-imperialist worlds of the 20th and 21st century, both East and West. Thus, the writer or writers of the originally Hellenistic Alexandrian Greek Alexander Romance, the main source of Alexander myth, they didn't scruple to simply make things up about him. Hence, though in hard actuality he didn't make it to the ends of the earth, he was fictitiously transported way up into the sky and way down to the bottom of the ocean. Ditto for the Persian authors of books of kings that made Alexander genetically a Persian king or the Quran, which imported him into a Muslim world, thereby authorizing tales and graphic illustrations, many very beautiful, of his visit to Mecca, for example, and so on. Or for the Jewish writers who had him visit Jerusalem, all of which fantasies share the same basic premise. And this is one that is today fiercely contested Namely, that Alexander was so important and so admirable that it was crucial somehow to get him on the right side, that is, your side, splendidly regardless of anything like historical authenticity. So, I draw towards my conclusion. In that sense of multiple cultural appropriation, there is no question but that Alexander was or has been perceived and received as great. Great enough to feature in over 70 national literatures and to be virtually worshipped as a more than merely mortal figure after as well as during his lifetime. But is he still today great enough or great in the right ways to be worshipped in a non-religious, metaphorical sense. That is, as an exemplar of qualities that we, or most of us, and of course I have to be ethnocentric here, would wish to see incarnated, embodied in the figure of a great political leader. Two factors seem to me to rule that out definitively, empire and bloodshed. But whereas the latter horror may seem uncontroversial, he shed a lot of blood, the former is a little more complicated, empire. In the course of achieving victories through which he conquered the Achaemenid Persian Empire, Alexander inevitably spilt much blood, including that of his fellow Greeks. If one were to ex quest was in some sense or in some degree justifiable and of course there is a case to be made that for example he liberated Asiatic Greeks from Persian control from non-Greek barbarian control then the <clears throat> bloodshed that that cost must to that extent be counted as justifiable but what about the post-conquest bloodshed and loss of life
Here I think at once, and it was mentioned in the previous talk, of the massacre of the Maloi in today's Multan, or of the death march that he quite unnecessarily conducted through the Baluchistan desert. But all the same, there still remains the legitimate question whether one should accept that Alexander's version of empire and imperialism was justified. For some, now I start with antiquity, but only for a very few, conquest and empire were intrinsically wicked. And I'm thinking here, for instance, of the wise men, the philosophers, whom Alexander's entourage encountered in what they called India, and about whom Onesicritos later wrote. But most ancients, to put it mildly, were not pacifists. For them, empire was the royal road to imposing not only their will, but also their values as far and as widely as possible, political and otherwise. To question the intrinsic value of empire is, I think, a peculiarly modern dialectic. I first came across it as a 13-year-old schoolboy in 1960 in the opening throes of what's called decolonization. Today, that discourse is unavoidable, as, for instance, in Oxford professor Nigel Bigard's recent book entitled Colonialism. And this is one of the latest shots in this acutely sensitive culture war. Which is why I believe, and this is how I conclude, most of my colleagues today do not think Alexander is or was all that great, especially not in any positive sense, positive moral sense, if greatness must necessarily comport some quotient of moral goodness. As for me, I'm rather more broad-minded. I'm less uh, judgmental, shall we say. Though Alexander himself had no idea that he was doing it, he did, I think, play a or the crucial role in changing the world. He played an epoch-making role, bringing about a Hellenistic or post-Hellenistic world within which things happened that would not have happened or not in the way they happened but for Alexander. And things that many millions of persons today consider to have very considerable merit. So I call in evidence the Christian Gospels and New Testament written and disseminated in Greek the lingua franca of the Middle East of that day, or, and we saw some images in the previous talk, representations of the Buddha for the first time in Greek-influenced anthropomorphic guise, a classic case of Greek humanism in not just aesthetic, but also moral religious action. So if you have been, thank you very much for listening. Hello. Thank you for such an informative session, Dr. Paul. Um, I know we all learned a lot. I would like to now invite Dr. Uh, Fakir Jazuddin Sahab, uh, Dr. Robin Lane Fox, and Dr. Richard Stoneman for their conversation. Um, I think Fakir Jazuddin Sahab will introduce the two.
I think they're pound. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Can you hear me at the back? No. Ah. Can't hear me at the front. Um. Yeah? Okay. Right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We've had a fascinating um, di um, speech by Dr. Paul Cartledge, where he has given his own observations on Alexander, whether or not he was great. Excellent. And I'm sure centuries from now, people are going to look back on Pakistan's history and ask whether many of our people, present leaders, were great or not. But this is something that all great people, um, all leaders, uh, have to endure and that is a post facto posthumous assessment. We have today... Okay. We have today two eminent speakers, historians, um, as was mentioned by Dr. Paul Cartledge, uh, Dr. Robin Lane Fox, whose book uh, was a seminal contribution to the history of Alexander. His book was a biography written when he was still at university and it was published 50 years ago in 1973. And it has been, in many ways, the benchmark of subsequent biographies. Um, I also have Dr. Richard Stoneman, and um, he is a scholar in his own right, and he's the one who curated the exhibition that was held at the British Library recently, about which Dr. Cartlett spoke. But rather than introducing them, I'm going to ask them, Bazubane Shire, to read their own CVs. So please, Robin, who are you? <laughs> I wish I knew. Ah. Uh, um, first of all, may I thank everybody here and all of you for coming. Um, tomorrow I will thank the organizers. I just want to say that it's afternoon. We don't want to bore you. Um, we hope you can hear us. Uh, I am unusual. I think because I have been uh, engaged with Alexander for most of my life uh, as an adult man for 60 years. I'm even more unusual um, because I have come to think I had a previous life. Um, I did the sensible thing as a young Macedonian. Um, in, I was born in about 360 BC and I joined the cavalry and I served with Alexander. And I, I saw a world, none of you, not even here in wonderful Sindh, you can imagine. For the first time, I entered India, which we had no idea. I saw faces like yours, charming people, and I did something very important. I took on an Indian lover, a lady. And we were very happy, Noor and I. Um, and after the campaign, we went and we lived in Western Asia, and she had never been quite sure about all the conquering and the killing, and she made me rethink what I had done. I laid out a garden, and she helped the poor daughters who lived round about, but she made me promise that I would never, ever talk again about Alexander. <laughs> but two things happened. Not long ago, she's still there in Western Asia in my mind, she's so beautiful, wonderful. We've had so many children, probably you are their descendants. <laughs> a man came to call a very famous film director from Hollywood uh, called Oliver Stone, who was making the big, big film on Alexander. And he asked me if I would give him advice as a consultant. I liked him as you would. I then surprised him and said, I didn't want money. I wanted to be able to ride on a horse in the front of every big cavalry charge that they filmed in the battle. And being Oliver, he allowed me to do it. Um, I can therefore say I am, I think, the only person here today, but not, of course, in the history of Sindh, who has charged against an armored war elephant, 24 of them, on horseback with a spear. But then secondly, I retired and 
she begged me not to talk anymore about the film or about Angelina Jolly who put snakes down my trousers. I'm not allowed to mention them. But I get a letter from the Endowment Trust Fund asking me to the country of my dreams, not just to Pakistan where I came for the first time in 1972 and back again in 1978, a different world. I have never been so far south. So I have said goodbye to my Indian wife and I have come specially for you. That is me. Thank you so much. Now I've got to follow that. <laughs> I would like to say that I've been living with Alexander now quite intimately for about 40 years, so I'm afraid I can't uh, clock up quite the years that Robin has mentioned. But uh, I first got interested in Alexander when I was trying to put together a book of uh, literary reminiscences about Greece, and I came across a great many interesting stories about Alexander, and I thought to myself, these are, these are good stories. Uh, you know, Bucephalus left his hoof print somewhere in the vicinity of Philippi. Here's Alexander going off uh, exploring with an angel, um, setting off in a diving bell. Where does all this come from? And I discovered that there was a work called the Alexander Romance, which was really not much known and certainly not much studied. Um, when I was an undergraduate. Uh, so I thought, if I'm going to get into this subject at all seriously, I have to get to know this work. I translated it. The, the Penguin translation is still, I'm pleased to say, selling reasonably steadily, um, some 30 years on. <clears throat> and that led on to more and more things. And I think it's fair to say that Alexander and his legends have become a little better known as a, as a result of, uh, of, what I, of what I did back in the 1990s. And uh, certainly the Alexander romance, which we shall, I'm sure, touch on a few more times in the course of this conversation this afternoon, is now deployed in teaching Alexander, which it certainly wasn't at uh, when, when I studied him at, at university, we were told then that Arian was the only reliable source and that there were some rather second-rate sources called Quintus Curtius Rufus and Diodorus, which you had to uh, put up with from time to time. But Arian was the, the leading figure and we knew that Arian was right because uh, uh, Arian said that his, he had really followed two main sources in putting together his history, Ptolemy and Aristobulus. Ptolemy was subsequently king of Egypt, and it would be ignominious for a king to tell a lie, so everything that was in Ptolemy's history must be true, and therefore, by extension, Arian, um, we were told, was the most reliable source. But uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, the uh, the view of Alexander has become rather more generous in the last few decades. <clears throat> um, the importance of the subsequent legend of Alexander has been recognized as being at least as important as, uh, as what he achieved in his own time. And the, the legend is, in a sense, his greatest achievement, um, as, uh, as was as Paul remarked just now, uh, the world of Christianity, the world of the Gospels, would not have arisen without the uh, creation of the Hellenistic world that, uh, that Alexander set in motion. Um, it's even been said that uh, um, the last stage of uh, Alexander's uh, creation of a world empire was the European Union, but we can't have anything to do with that anymore, I'm sorry to say. But as for me, um, I continue to, uh, to work on Alexander. The exhibition at the British Library, which closed last week, has just been mentioned, and I was very proud and honored to be involved in the, uh, in the creation of the, uh, the, the catalog for that. I think it's been quite a success. 
I have become increasingly interested in, as an extension of my interest in Alexander, in the interaction of Greeks with uh, the inhabitants of the Indian subcontinent, and that means you as well as your neighbors in India. Um, classicists tend to, well, have to talk about India, because India is what it was um, at the time that Alexander came. The River Indus was the Indian River. Um, <clears throat> I've worked on I've worked on the, uh, a big book called The Greek Experience of India, which came out uh, four years ago now, and particularly on one of the, uh, the younger contemporaries of Alexander Megasthenes, who wrote the first uh, ethnographic study, if you like, of India. I've also taken an interest in some other parts of the ancient world. I wrote a book about Xerxes, the Persian king, a few years ago, but what's going to absorb me from um, for the rest of my days, as far as I can see, is this matter of the interaction of Greeks and ancient Indians, uh, not in a military sense, but in the fields of philosophy and literature and science. And I become very interested in the possible influence of early Buddhism on some aspects of Greek philosophy. So watch this space. But that's all I'll say about that for now. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. Good. Richard has touched um, in his introductory remarks about, um, he's touched upon sources uh, which we can rely upon or cannot rely upon as far as Alexander's chronology is concerned. Um, Robin, uh, something that has always intrigued me is, where are these documents which, um, you know, we talk about, we talk about Arian, we talk about uh, the subs, what were they, in what form were they, uh, and um, how reliable, <coughs> where are they? Uh, this is a great question. They are all copied down um, in generations of scribes, and they end up in manuscripts, some of them very beautiful. Most of them have come into historical consciousness in the modern world through Constantinople or the libraries of Venice and the Vatican. Some of them are in Paris. They've all diffused from the Greek Byzantine Empire um, into the um, collections of Western libraries. And it's from there that we have the lovely, conveniently printed texts that we work with. But there is one other alternative. That is original inscriptions on the stones or clay tablets in which they were first made. And there are some that mention Alexander. One very exciting one, found recently in the basement of the museum in Cairo again, enormously important. We have, uh, since I wrote my book, Knowledge Keeps Coming, found um, the very clay tablet of the days leading up to Alexander's great victory in Gorgamila. Who knows what we'll find? Uh, there are always surprises, and those are original texts very few which are underground. Otherwise, they are manuscripts in libraries. Wonderful. Well, this kind of fills, fills up the gap of, in our knowledge of, um, because we, uh, we've never seen these, and I, I don't think they've ever been reproduced as such. Yep. So I'm um, delighted that you should be able to give this explanation. Um, Richard, you talked about teachers, and of course, the most famous of, of them all was Aristotle, who uh, not only taught um, uh, Alexander, but then also various people, Hephaestion, the, uh, his favorite, and um, a number of others, Cassander and Ptolemy, both of whom later became kings in the post-Alexander distribution of empire. So Aristotle's view, as you've mentioned, um, was that barbarian nations, like cattle, need the hand of a cultured person, i.e. a Greek, to get the best out of them. And I couldn't help but be reminded of Lord Macaulay, and his attempts to make, it, make Englishmen of us. I mean, we're halfway there, but uh, Lord Macaulay. And Leonid Nidas, a kinsman of his mother, who subjected Alexander to a very tough physical regime, rather like Prince Charles had to undergo at Gordonston. Would you like to talk about um, the teachers that Alex, uh, Alexander had to, uh, you know, was inspired Alexander? Well, there's no doubt that Aristotle was the, the most important of his teachers. He was, uh, and there, I think there's very little doubt, though 
we begin to doubt everything. The more you look at Alexander, the more you begin to think perhaps everything was invented afterwards. But there does seem to be sufficient evidence that Alexander was, um, that Aristotle was summoned by Philip to, to, uh, to Pella, the capital of Macedon, um, in order to educate uh, Philip's son Alexander and uh, a number of his uh, younger or a number of his contemporaries at school age in their in their early teens. Um, there are a few other tutors mentioned in uh, in the sources, but Aristotle is by far the most by far the most important. Um, whether whether we can believe anything we're told about what Aristotle taught Alexander is a very doubtful matter. Uh, Ajaz has just mentioned the, uh, the uh, advice to, uh, um, to, tr to treat all barbarian nations as, as, as farm animals. You have to look after them and use them for your own purposes. Well, did, uh, did Aristotle really really say that? Did it really have an impact on Alexander? Um, I'm quite sure that the geographical learning that he imparted had a, had a, a significant meaning for, for Alexander. Aristotle believed that if you reached the top of the Hindu Kush, you would probably on a clear day be able to see the end of the world. Um, and that was, I'm quite sure, partly in Alexander's mind when he uh, uh, went off piste and uh, departed from his, uh, his job in the Persian Empire to, uh, to come into, into the Indian lands. What else did uh, Alexander learn from Aristotle? In the Middle Ages, uh, there was a very important uh, text which began, in, uh, began as an Arab t Arabic text, The Secret of Secrets which is partly a treatise on physiognomy and partly about kingship, and it is all put in the mouth of Aristotle educating Alexander. And this was one of the main reasons why Aristotle, why both, well, Aristotle was a very important author for the Arab Middle Ages, and Alexander came along. Alexander became a great astrologer and all kinds of other things in that tradition. And that all came about because of the, uh, the initial historical connection when Aristotle was finding Athens a bit uncomfortable and decided to take up this job in Pella, for better or worse. Do you want to add anything, Robin? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could I add perhaps five things? Um, Alexander had a brain. It's quite easy to read discontented uh, English books who want to criticize Alexander for his many failings. He's clever. He's clever. He's been taught by Aristotle. So what did Aristotle teach him? We know one crucial thing. <coughs> Aristotle, um, I insist on this now, I, I was a bit hesitant in my book, actually corrected a text of Homer, of the Iliad, and went through it for Alexander. Um, mm. And so Homer, who represented many of the values of Alexander as the hero in search of glory and fame and um, prowess, is presented to Alexander by the cleverest man in the world. And the addition, the copy, is taken into Asia by Alexander and it's kept in, in a special place. That's one thing. Secondly, I have a suggestion. All of you might try it. We are told that Alexander used to like to think every evening whether he had done in the day what he started out to do and also what he had failed to do. This is Aristotle's advice also, and I believe Alexander has it because of Aristotle. Have you done what you should have done today, and what is it you have not done? You have fallen asleep in a talk in, in the hall here. So you remember that when you go to bed. Right. Thirdly, as Richard has said, he taught him very bad geography, so Alexander had no idea how big the world really was. Uh, that's very important. And fourthly, in the general setting, of King Philip's world, he would have um, emphasized to him the importance of the citizen state. Um, this is important, we'll discuss for Alexander, who found several cities over Asia and here in India in a different sense. I'd just like to say, fifthly, 
that we now have, I think, um, in the last five years, actually discovered and realized for the first time clearly where Aristotle's special school for training Alexander and all his boys lies in Macedon. It's not just the site you're shown when you go there. It's very exciting, and we are hoping to excavate it in the next five years. It has got a rounded further extension from our preliminary surveys, and there is much discussion what this is. Some people think, quite possibly, it is a gym. So they exercise their minds, listening to Aristotle, and then they exercise their bodies. But I am me. I think it is where they rode the horses. Um, so we have big surprises coming. Never, ever think for one moment that Alexander is dead. No. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Richard, you had mentioned in um, your book that it was the king's duty to gain first-hand knowledge as much of his empire as possible. Napoleon's expedition of Egypt uh, with its extensive scientific staff and research program was probably planned on the model of Alexander with India in mind. Um, and of course, we've been subjected to it with visits by royalty, um, Edward VII, and uh, subsequently then the Prince of Wales, Edward, later the Edward VIII, um, etc., coming to the colonies, and most recently, Her Majesty, uh, the late Ma um, Queen Elizabeth. Um, I'm going to ask both of you, what was it that um, a triggered, what was the motive behind Alexander's urge to explore. Beyond the age of 16, suddenly he has this epiphany and he wants to travel and he never goes back. What was it? What was the motive that um, uh, inspired him? Please. Shall I speak first? Um, well, Alexander inherited from his father when, when Philip was assassinated um, a plan to make a war of revenge on the, on the Persian Empire. Um, part, uh, with the purpose of which was, among other things, to unify the, the, the Greek states under their, their new and often rather resented Macedonian leader. Um, so Philip, Philip was intending to uh, make war on Persia, and part, of the re and part of the excuse would be revenge for the Persian destruction of the uh, magnificent buildings of Athens in the uh, invasions of the early 5th century. Now, Alexander inherited this, uh, this plan, but he turned it into something, I, I'm quite sure, much beyond what anything, any, anything that Philip had ever had in mind. And uh, that shows really in the, uh, in the way the campaign started. He, uh, he um, crossed the Hellespont into, uh, into northwestern Asia Minor. The first, the first battle that he fought with a Persian army was with the local commander. Um, the, the king back in, uh, uh, back in Persepolis or Susa thought this was just a little local disturbance on the border, didn't need to be taken very seriously. It was only when Alexander got as far as the, uh, um, as the other end of the Mediterranean that the King Darius III um, realized that uh, something, something more was up and that Alexander actually intended to uh, make for the heart of the Persian Empire and decapitate it. Um, so the, we have this motive of revenge, but at the same time, um, there is the, the, the motive to discover. Yep. Um, Arian talks repeatedly about Alexander's pothos, mm -hmm. a Greek word meaning desire or longing. And every time he does something that's a bit startling, it's because of his pothos. He just, just wanted to do some more, wanted to see what was around the next corner. And that uh, is clearly part of the uh, um, part of the motivation for the extension of the uh, of the campaign of conquest into the subcontinent. Um, it's uh, well, perhaps sorry. Um, perhaps ask, um, do you want to take yeah. over there? What is your views? Um, I think you must remember uh, what it means to be a king in Macedon. I divide kings into two. Do they inherit majesty and a splendid uh, myth that they are superior to us all? They're surrounded by luxury. You never see them. You never see the terrible truth 
that they are only a bit like the English Prince Harry? Um, <laughs> or are they um, kings who rule by achievement? And the Macedonian monarchy is firmly um, focused on a king who is brave, can, as we say, deliver, deliver the goods. You must conquer, distribute the spoil, the booty, and as a Homeric hero came home to Alexander, the new Achilles, you must win glory. It's no use sitting still. They'd have killed him. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a very important thing. Secondly, he wishes to, I think, um, excel his father, Philip. Very, very important. Um, those are two major wishes. He's conquering the Persian Empire. The Persians have ruled um, in a, a way here as far as India. So, of course, he goes right through to India and then beyond because he wants to get to the edge of the world. The world. And Aristotle has told him that it's far nearer than it is. He had no idea about Burma or China or whatever. Uh, he thought that all of you lived just on the edge of the ocean that ran around the world. Well, you can do many things with your life. Of course you can. You can be good. You can do wonderful things as a doctor. But actually to ride your horse into the waters at the edge of the world for the first time and then look out across a sea into nothing would be, in my view, a pretty good way to spend it. Well, Robin, we believe that we are living at the edge of the world. There's nothing beyond. We believe we are living at the edge of the world. There's nothing beyond as far as we're concerned. <laughs> well, I can well see why you do, having been here. <laughs> well, um, could I continue? You yes, of course. I, I, well, I was going to conclude what I was saying about uh, pothos, longing, which is, yes. which is, of course, not just desire. It's an intellectual passion, mm -hmm. um, such as yeah. was uh, um, fostered by, by Aristotle. And this has led to the idea, which goes back to uh, antiquity, that... Uh, Aristotle actually gave Alexander a commission to go and collect mm. scientific facts. Right. Please send back plant specimens, yeah. and botanical uh, items. Yeah. Could you send me an elephant? Because I want to see what it looks like inside. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, uh, the, the most we know is that the cattle of Arigayam were regarded as very fine. Alexander sent a, little, uh, a herd of those back to Macedon. But I think this this idea of Alexander as a, as a um, Napoleonic research expedition yeah. has been fairly thoroughly exploded yeah. now. But uh, nonetheless, the opportunity was there for those who accompanied him to pursue researches of all kinds, and they did. Well, many years ago, um, uh, Robin and Richard, uh, when I was a student in England, my landlord's father came uh, to call on him. He was fairly aged. And um, they said, uh, this is Ijazuddin. And he said, oh, uh, where's he from? So they said, he's from um, Pakistan. So the man looked at him, uh, looked at me, and he said, Pakistan? Where is that? Oh. <laughs> so they said, well, it's, it's next to India, granddad. And he looked at them, and he said, India? Where is that? So eventually, the grandson took pity on him and said, it's okay, Grandad. It's all the other side of Brighton, as far as you're concerned. Uh, <laughs> so, as far as Alexander was concerned, it was all the other side of the Indus. Yeah, but uh, can I... You've mentioned... Um, both of you have talked about, and you particularly, Robin, have mentioned about the almost symbiotic relationship between a leader and the lead, yeah. in this case, the army, and the close relationship that had to exist. It was rather like him and Bucephalus. In that case, it happened to be a horse, but I think on a broader level, it was with him and his army. Absolutely. And that symbiotic relationship remains when he reaches the Bias. And then he's guided not by his own pothos, well. but he's guided by the Greek element in his army, yep. and who refused to proceed. And then he, the leader becomes the lead. So if I may just move on to the army, we have, when, he come, when they come to the subcontinent, I'd like to now focus on the subcontinent, his presence here, because that's the purpose of the seminar. Um, he begins with Helene's in his army. But by the time he leaves via Macron, there's almost a, an alteration in the percentage. So you have what began as a majority of um, Greeks suddenly become a minority of Greeks. Could you just talk about the yes. relationship with the army? I would uh, very gladly. I'd say four or five things, as usual. <laughs> um, first, Alexander fights in the front line 
and leads his men straight into the enemy line. You may know generals. They don't do that now. Uh, they may have done in their past, but this is so powerful to men who are following, to know that your king is just in front of you. Believe you me, even on a film, if you know that the leading film star is going as fast as he can towards the enemy, most of whom are being played by Frenchmen, um, it makes you even keener to go after him. Alexander knew no fear. Most amazing thing. And personal heroics are central to his hold on his men. I always said to my children, they've been very successful, never ask of others what you are not prepared to do yourself. And that is an Alexander principle, I think. That's one. Secondly, the nature of the army, it is Philip's creation. Philip is the father of the Hellenistic world. That is very important. And um, we can see it in many ways. Uh, and the crucial balance of the line, the cavalry on the right are the item of what the Americans call shock and awe. They gallop um, at great speed, draw the enemy cavalry away, and then cut into the center and go for people face to face. Then following up are the famous foot soldiers who never actually win the battle, but they clear the broken forces away, armed with their long spears, the sarissas, incredibly difficult uh, to use. In India, you'd seen nothing like this before. Um, then you join many of you for pay. People will do anything for money, for, for a, a living. And you join Alexander's army. This is important. There is no coherent one nation resistance to Alexander. We are all the heirs to nationalism, the greatest single force apart from sex in the world at the moment. Nationalism doesn't really exist in Alexander's world. It's not the same. You are aware of being uh, an Indian or a, 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 a tribe in India, yeah. um, but you are not fighting for India uh, as an Indian nation. Um, so the face of the army changes, but what is so striking is that Alexander puts um, people from the conquered peoples right into the world-conquering units that he himself had invaded and brought. Now, this is not a small thing. Um, if you study, as I have, the early Arab conquests, or indeed the Mughal conquests, they don't fill the famous inside units of the army with Persians or Indians. Alexander does this for a reason. We are told, and people underplay it, that he came to believe men are not divided into Greeks and barbarians. They are divided into the, the good and the bad, and he wished to be the lord of the best. Uh, it is now an army open to talent. All of you I'm looking at, you could all be in it with me in the cavalry. It'd be wonderful. There we would be, the great companion cavalry, which once had conquered you, you now join it. That is a very important principle, too. Alexander isn't just a soldier, either. I come back to this. Fine. Um, Richard, uh, what I, can I ask you, linking it to the army, because we, yep. can, we can analyze the army and the composition of the army, but I'd like to move, because here, you have Alexander traveling at tremendous speed yes. by even yes. modern standards, yes. traveling through unknown territory. Yes. Can you just, um, uh, Richard, talk to me about, talk us through the logistics involved yes. in living off the land when he was on agri, you know, living off the land, <coughs> and um, in, when he came to Macron, living off raw animals, yes. in yes. effect. So could we talk about the logistics, yes. both of you, on the logistics of handling okay. an army of this size? May I urge all of you, who I hope will be fascinated to study this extraordinary period, to remember the big question that Fakir has rightly raised. How did they manage to eat? How, too, did they find water? <coughs> water for all the horses and the animals. I think there are several reasons. Um, the Persian Empire is well equipped with stations, with food, all down the royal roads, which was there for travelers in emergency. They came in and they took it. We also know that the Persian rulers kept large surplus supplies in case of a year of famine. They could probably sell them back to people at huge profit. Alexander could just eat a year's surplus. Otherwise, they rounded the food off from wherever they went and carried it in carts or with the fleet. When they come to India, 
What is so striking, I think Richard will agree, is that in the Indus Valley there are so many hundreds of settlements, cities that they see, all gone now in the drier weather, and they can live much more easily off the immensely fertile lands they're coming down the Indus Valley. So they rely on forcing people to give them food, sometimes buying it, sometimes eating the surplus that others have. And here in India, the big question in Iran, water is not so important, as you all sadly know from the terrible recent floods. At times, not always, Pakistan has too much water. Other times it has too little. So that's what I would say. But please remember as you read the three questions. How did the men eat? How did they provide enough water for the cavalry, the horses, and all the animals pulling uh, the army? And one other small thing easily solved in India, what about salt for the men and the army? Salt is a crucial element in our ability to continue. And here, uh, Alexander found the great salt mountains, the salt range up near Jalalpur and other places they were not short of salt. Well, the, the agrophagy, yeah. I mean, why did they specifically talk about the agrophagy and put them on the map? Yeah. Because yeah. There was, it was an agricultural community. Please, yeah. Richard. I, the the I, one I, thing he hated, sorry, uh, some of the troops ate a fruit that was long and very sweet, and they had very bad stomachs. This, I think, is the best thing Alexander ever did. He banned it. It was the banana. And he told them not to eat it. I hate bananas. <laughs> right. Please. I can't, I can't agree with you there. Um, <laughs> banana was a great discovery. But uh, I think the, uh, one of the reasons for the savagery of Alexander's advance down the Indus is, this import, is the importance of acquiring sufficient food and water because parts of the, uh, parts of the route that the, uh, that the fleet and the accompanying army had to follow were, were, are quite barren, and in places he had to go further and further inland to, uh, to s find sufficient foods. I mean, why did, he, why did he go and attack the Malloy town that we were speaking of earlier, which is 60 miles east of the Indus? They covered the ground in a single night, according to the sources, which is pretty superhuman, if, if so. But the reason they had to go there, go so far, and then to slaughter all the inhabitants, was to find a sufficient supply of food for Alexander's own army. Um, and this... Um, this, this was savagery, but there were other ways in which uh, Alexander um, always had an eye to uh, ensuring supplies. I mean, why did he make, at the very beginning of the campaign, um, it's not just topography that means he has to go to Sardis, first of all. It's where the Persians kept their gold, because Philip had created, had made Macedon a wealthy state, but it wasn't that wealthy, and a bit of Persian gold was going to make a big difference to Alexander's ability to continue. Right. Robin had mentioned in his book, and I do advise you after this session, get a copy of it, read it. It's, um, it's a brilliant, brilliant biography. Um, Robin, you'd mentioned that uh, you quoted a British colonel who describes the composition of the British Army at the time, which wasn't just fighting forces, but it consisted of um, traders, um, who were uh, grains, salt, sweetmeats, shawls, carpenters, blacksmiths, tailors, mochis, etc. And I thought you might be interested. My ancestor, there was a gentleman called Fakir Shadin, he was uh, charged with providing commissariat facilities for the um, British troops who had visited, were coming to meet Ranjit Singh in December 1838. And I'm just going to, just to give you an idea of the quantities involved. Um, uh, this was the instruction that was issued to him in December 1838 to feed Lord Auckland's forces and his entourage. He was told, we want 100,000 fowls, we want 20,000 morns of wheat, we want 60,000 morns of gram, Good God. we want 5,000 moot, we want 3,000 grinding stones, 1,500 morns of milk, 
and the marsh ki dal, which is one of the lentils, 3,000 mons, and fuel, 40,000 mons. And daily, the British camp needed 15,000 eggs and 4,000 chickens. And the British weren't particularly interested which came first, the chicken or the egg. They just wanted both. Now, I really mention this because these are the kind of logistics involved. Um, and I'm talking about 1838, and we can imagine what it was like 2,000 years earlier. So uh, I think it's given the audience an indication of how um, one of the, the uh, successes that um, Alexander had was as not just the leader of men, but a man who was um, a master of logistics as such. Can we move now? Here is a man who knows very little. He's moved into um, foreign territory. What intelligence sources did he have to rely upon as he moved through, and which language did they communicate in? Uh, languages. Languages, yeah. and uh, which uh, intelligence sources? Uh, these are all very good questions. Um, Alexander had uh, um, a Persian mistress. He ended up with three Iranian wives, and he also fell in love with a Persian Iranian eunuch, or anyway, in lust with him. So he had many multilingual life in bed. Um, but we don't know that uh, they ever learned a foreign language. Here is a very good example. Um, one of the ascetic Indians who followed them became known to the Greeks as Kalenos, because whenever they said to him um, in the morning, hello, how are you? He'd say, Kale, Kale, which meant, you know, all fine, all fine. So they called him Kalenos. They didn't bother, many of them, with his real Indian name. He couldn't communicate here in, the, uh, um, uh, in Pakistan in the local language, like far too many British, and alas, I know no Urdu like me. Um, they relied on interpreters, and it got very complicated. I can only make sense of it thinking that there were a string of interpreters. There was somebody who spoke to one person who perhaps knew Persian, who talked to a man who knew Persian and Greek, who told Alexander. So you can understand, I'm sure Richard will talk about this tomorrow, how one's impression of your wonderful country is coming through um, several barriers. And we perhaps rather mistake what it is you are telling us. Um, the, the Greeks cannot at first, not at first, communicate easily. And they are believing what they are told, often through two or three languages. That, uh incident you just referred to where, um, is the one where Onesicritus is sent to, uh, uh, to interview the naked philosophers at Taxila and he, he wrote in, in his record of that meeting that he had to use a series of three interpreters and that to expect any philosophical doctrine uh, to become clear through that series of three interpreters was like expecting water to flow clear through mud. Um. And one, one thing I'd like to add, um, we've had a lovely description of all the people who must follow the army, very important when picturing it, also the women they took on. Yes, of course. It's quite plain that the troops, of course, had uh, women who followed them. Um, uh, they were Iranians or they were indeed even Indians. Indians, yes. And they must have somehow talked with them, even if they were just saying, you know, take your clothes off or whatever. Um, um, we, we don't see this enough. Yeah. Don't think of Alexander's army as only men. It became yeah. an army with many women followers. May I, um, sorry Richard, because we'll be running out of time. Um, we're dealing with the Indus. Alexander's reached the Indus. He's got Malloy, etc. And then suddenly, as he, he works his way down and he's now intending to go along the sea route. Yeah. Can we just very quickly talk about the Navy? Uh, I mean, how did he build a navy which would then carry him down the Indus no. and allow no. Nyakos then to follow the sea route? Yes. Uh, this, is, this is another great... Uh, I'm so sorry. I, I think I'm better, more audible now. I may have been talking too faintly. Um, this is another great question. Macedonians are not good on the sea. Alexander cannot swim. I'll explain tomorrow. Um, but he has people who are good with the sea, uh, eventually some Greeks, Phoenicians from the Levant, Egyptians, and all the Indian boats 
that are on the Indus come and they're obviously getting rewards and being paid, so they join him and they become his fleet. And they are crucial because for transport, a fleet and a river is fast, like a railway now. Um, to take goods overland is much slower. But the Macedonians are expert in managing trees and in working trees and working wood. I'm sure they worked with brilliant Indians, but this is a skill that they have from their own heavily forested homeland. Yeah. So they can build the ships uh, with Greek um, uh, experts telling them, but they can't really row them. They rely on you or Egyptians or whoever are with them. And then the fleet is crucial, partly for the military, but also for supplies. Well, I don't have much to add to that, I must oh, say. Yeah. Um, the, but yes, I mean, the combination of building of ships with the Macedonian carpenters and uh, no doubt deploying every kind of ship and boat that was available on, on the Indus. Um, um, some people think that Alexander's arrival was very bad news for the trees now in Pakistan. They cut down many, many trees to make the boats. Too many. Yes. Too many. It's always the way. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Now we reach, um, uh, I leave because there'll be a whole series of uh, specialized discussions tomorrow mm -hmm. on aspects of what we've just touched upon. But I wanted this session, as was my talk, to just give you the broad outline of the implications of Alexander's presence in, um, uh, on this side of the Indus. Now, Alexander reaches, we know that he had a mutiny, we've discussed this earlier. His Hellenic troops don't want to go any further. He decides to turn back. He's at the Bias. Um, and um, Richard, in your book, you quoted Anthony Thwait. Uh, Thwait. And um, there's a wonderful thing which I'm going to repeat. Anybody, do you know uh, Tofik Rifat? Have you heard of him? He was a poet. Have you heard of Anthony Thwait? He was a person who came to Pakistan and who sponsored a number of Pakistani poets. And that's why there is a special resonance of that quotation. And if you don't mind, with your permission, I'm going to quote it. It's called At the Indus. And Anthony Thwaite writes, over the other side was a possible paradise, untouched, immaculate, the dreamt of place. And then they turn back. Oh, yeah. And I think this is the most poignant part of Alexander's life, oh, yeah. where there he is, as he believes, at the edge of the universe, oh. and he suddenly turns back. Now, why do you think he oh. did it? Right. Um, there are modern discussions, all of which have gone wrong. The old view is true. Um, it is not that for the first time he will pass beyond the boundary of the Persian Empire. That's the view of a good scholar, Bruder Jacobs. And so the men re rebelled because they were leaving the Persian Empire. And it's certainly not true, as another scholar remarkably has tried to argue, that Alexander was merely uh, pretending. He didn't want to go on. Um, he wanted to turn back, but he wanted the men to choose. He wanted to go on. And when the officers wouldn't, he was so angry, he locked himself in a tent. He wouldn't speak to them for three days. And then he had to give in. Um, the prelude to the uh, turning back, so familiar to all of you. It had poured with rain. In India, the Greeks learned for the first time about the monsoon period. They're trying to walk, march, and fight in it. It's impossible. The water is rising so fast. Wonderful descriptions of it. Secondly, snakes. I don't know about snakes in Karachi. I really hope not. Um, but snakes all over the Punjab, and they were uh, uh, biting them, they were hiding in the rain, in the tents, they were demoralized. Thirdly, they weren't all like me, and totally happy and brave when attacking an elephant. And they heard that there were at least another 500, 800 elephants waiting beyond the river Ganges. And lastly, spare a thought for them. They've been away now for already eight years of, uh, ten years, eight years of solid marching, marching, marching. Did they want to see their wives? Probably not. They much preferred their Indians or their Iranians. But they did sometimes think, uh, one day we Home want sick. to go home to see our parents. Homesick. Homesick. Yep. Uh, Richard, 
yes. concluding. I think, the rain, I think the rain is a very important okay. factor, actually, because, um, as, as you said, um, they, they didn't know about the monsoon. Um, for all they knew, it rained all the time in India. It was never going to stop, um, and they couldn't stand it anymore. Their armor was rusty. Um, their, uh, their clothes had fallen to pieces because of the rain. They actually had to wear Indian clothes. Um, this must have been terrible for them, mm. <laughs> not mm. to be able to wear a proper Greek or Macedonian kit anymore. And they had heard, I'm sure of this, uh, Alexander at least, of the river Ganges. They'd heard of the distance involved. They'd heard of the kingdom, the Nanda kings, uh, ruling down at Palimbothra, they called it. And they realized another big, big kingdom and big battle was ahead. In the rain, the snakes, the exhaustion, the tattered clothes, it was too much. Okay. Now, with your permission, because um, I think the audience would also like to ask questions of uh, uh, the two distinguished speakers that we have here. So may I begin? And certainly, first question, please. Would you identify yourself? And then, of course. I wanted to ask you, given that uh, Alexander had recruited locally, no, did... I, I can't really hear. Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry. Um, I, I can't hear very well. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm anyway, I'm so old and deaf from the thunder of warfare and horses. Okay, mm -hmm. given that Alexander had recruited locally, did, did uh, his military technology and logistics capability uh, did he leave any of that behind with the local people and did that have any effect on the local powers mm -hmm. after he left? Yeah. Um, did you catch the question that? is that um, with this Macedonian technology that he had of warfare, mm -hmm. okay, did he leave any of it behind um, as such and has it in any way improved our own technological capability and is Raul Pindi today the successor to the Macedonian tradition oh, of military warfare? What an excellent question. Um, well, uh, first of all, um, yes, very importantly in Indian history, um, we are told that, of course, Chandra Gupta, who comes after Alexander, and he starts the Maurya dynasty, wins the big victories, and uh, really conquers more of India than Alexander had. And they said to him, how did you manage to do it? And he replied, I saw Alexander when I was a young man. That's important. Secondly, a modern military, there is a big, big difference. Now the generals uh, sit behind the lines. They are pressing buttons. Uh, many of the, the, the weaponry and the, the missiles being fired bravely in um, Ukraine are just you press a button. You don't see what happens. Um, it is not the terrifying face-to-face -face experience um, with a sword drawn, it's either you or them. Face-to-face, -face, you have to cut them in half. Oh. But they fought lions. Alexander, as a, a boy, would fight a lion alone with a weapon. So I think that the change from what I would call battle to warfare is different. That's one. Secondly, generals are too precious, perhaps, really to lead their men. That is a big difference. And thirdly, the weaponry. But the sense of strategic geography, spatial geography on the battlefield, the sense of trickery, of deception. Uh, people study Alexander in the major military colleges with good reason. I went, one of the strangest things, to be interviewed by Fidel Castro, who sent me to Cuba, uh, and Castro really admired Alexander. And he asked me very, very hard penetrating questions about small events. And I said, but why do you do this, Commandante? He said, I want to know were Alexander's minor campaigns cleverer than mine? Wow. Lovely. Would you like to add to this? Okay. Um, well, um, Robin, we're very careful about what we say about generals, so I'm cautioning you as well. Okay. But um, any other question, please, from the audience? May I? Uh, oh, we have many. May please. I? Oh, nice. Yes, we have many please. questions. This is Hamid. lovely. Okay. My name is Hamid Akhund, and uh, I have the honor of uh, 
hosting this as one of the workers. My ignorance kicks me to ask this question. Uh, did Alexander exist? Uh -huh. Or is he uh, Aryan's fiction? And everybody else has knitted around him, saying this is what happened, that is what happened. But it could possibly be something that was not there. You mean there and are many Alexanders? As he said in your dreams. Yeah, indeed, indeed, so, like. did he really exist? Thank you. Well, that is a very interesting. Yeah. Could you answer that? I, 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 yeah, that is a very interesting question, um, and uh, I think it draws attention to the fact that Arian makes Alexander the hero. Um, that, uh, but, it, but, but Arian is not the first. Um, but, Writing earlier than Arian, we have Quintus Curtius, who also focused on the personality of Alexander rather, rather than the, the uh, impersonal movement of historical forces or whatever it might be that Alexander simply happened to embody. Um, and even before that, we have uh, the earliest, in, in my opinion, the earliest written text about Alexander, which is the Alexander Romance, which I think was probably written w in about two generations after mm -hmm. Alexander died, and that already focuses uh, on Alexander as an individual, not, not, as a, not as an embodiment of historical forces, and how, I mean, Alexander in the Romance is, is is a fiction, is a, he is like a fictional hero, but uh, um, so I think, you know, that is a very uh, interesting way of looking at Alexander and thinking, you know, was it just the author of, uh, of whatever book it was that, uh, that made Alexander? But it can't be so, can it? Um, the, uh, the record of what he, what he and his army achieved is, is too extensive for him to be merely a fictional character, but nonetheless, he is in every uh, rewriting of him also a fictional character. Does that do? Um, could I stress Philip? Uh, Philip is, is a crucial uh, element. Alexander has grown up in a world of conquest, city foundations, Philippi before Alexandria, and the great gain of the last 30 years, the archaeology now of Philip's enormous palace um, in Macedon, which you must go to see when you go to Greece, much more interesting than Athens, and it's huge. The old idea that there was a simple kind of tribal society that Alexander turned into a kingdom is complete nonsense. He grew up in a royal kingdom where Philip, with the coinage, very important, the cities, and the army, all Philip's creation. So he is a product of the historical force called Philip. Uh, yeah, can we have, so uh, we just come back to you, I promise. Um, just give the uh, wider audience an opportunity. Agenda balance, please, no ladies. Uh, oh, come, please. Yeah, me? Could you hand over the, hello? Please. I promise to come back to you, sir. Hello. I'm Nusrat Khwaja. My question is about the uh, sources he relied on or the Greeks relied on to plot their navigation through eight years of coming to the Indus. Can, can you just tell me that? To the plot their na navigation. The question is uh, what, uh, what information did the Greeks have in order to, uh, to plot their, their navigation uh, through, the, through the whole uh, campaign and down the, down the Indus? Uh, do you know? <laughs> Um, well, sorry. first of all, you were there. <laughs> um, we have <laughs> heard cavalry, all the great but... things about Alexander. I must uh, remind you that he is also great because there are some great mistakes, errors, blind spots, things go wrong. He drinks too much. He kills one of his father's officers. And much of the time he is lost in the broad sense. He thinks he is reaching Europe when he is on the edge of Tajikistan. When he's coming down the river Indus, he begins by thinking, I'll explain tomorrow, it flows round into the Nile in Egypt. He relies on local information um, very much. And of course, it has to be understood, and it also has to be correctly given. Yeah. Um, he believed that he'd come to the Indian Ocean, I'll explain tomorrow, it was the edge of the world. 
<laughs> he had no idea what lay, lay south of it. Please, your um, question. No drones, no sat-nav. Um, like me, with, in my car, I'm lost most of the time. I can't do sat-nav, I'm too old. Um, but I'm Alexander's heir. Well, may I amplify that, um, Robin? That many of the medieval maps, I shared some with you in my lecture, many of the medieval maps were in fact the property of the king. So the Portuguese, the Sp Spaniards, and, and the Dutch, etc., they would lend these maps to sea captains who would then be required to update them and then return the maps to the Royal Treasury where they would, the cartographer, who would then update whatever information they had. So this sequence of constantly updating knowledge was part of it, and I'm sure that this... Um, this is such a good question. Uh, sorry, but it's so good, I'm going to go, go back to you. Um, there is a debate as to whether Aristotle had maps in his school. We know that his pupil, Theophrastus, had them. Um, but what mainly we know is that there were written accounts by sea captains called periodoi, or similar words, periplus, um, which were uh, written accounts of the coastal line. And it's those written accounts that are uh, supplanted by new written accounts. There's not the Fakir model that you go with the royal map and you follow it and you change it a bit as you see. You read a book, it's all wrong, and then you write a book that's right and you hope the next person reads it. Um, it it's, it's, it's a very good question. Right. The final... Okay. My name is Iftikhar Salahuddin. You know, we remember, we always talk about Alexander as great. But this uh, compliment to Alexander is mostly given by the Western world. If you look at the behavior of Alexander while he marched through Persia, first of all, as he reaches Persopolis, the gates of Persopolis were open to him. Despite that, he destroyed the entire city as if it did not matter. And then as you see, as he marches through Persia, he not only destroys Persopolis, but all the temples of Zoroastrianism. So Zoroastrians who consider in their faith Ahriman, which is the evil of the faith, they compare Alexander to Ahriman. So Alexander must be great to the West, but he is reviled in Persia and other parts of the world. Dr. Salahuddin. <laughs> Dr. Salahuddin is um, he's a scholar, apart from being a medical doctor, but he's a scholar and he's written a number of books. And the most recent one, which will be published shortly, released shortly, is on Persia. So he has an immediate interest in it. So um, a deep concern for your observation. But it is also, I think, as uh, Richard had mentioned, um, it was this obsession against what Persians had done to the Greeks, Macedonians, it was his way of getting back. So forgive him post posthumously for having done this. Um, GP's final question, but very briefly. Yeah. Uh, my question to- uh, Your name? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Please. Professor Munis Ayaz. Of course. Uh, earlier, uh, you mentioned about the uh, Kalyanos, who's known uh, uh, in uh, our history as Kalyano, yeah. uh, uh, which meant uh, all-knowing, you know, Kalyano. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, childhood, we used to see a toothpaste named Kalinos. Kalinos, yes. Is yes. that after him? <laughs> Unless your teeth were smarter that than your brain was. That was 1960s, I think, yeah. or 70s. Your teeth were smarter than your brain was. I don't think there's any connection between the two. Can I um, finally conclude this? Forgive me, madam, you can talk to them over tea. Um, may I conclude this session, which is extremely stimulating, and um, for me personally, well, I hope for the audience as well. But may I conclude by asking both of you one single uh, question. If you were to meet Alexander today, what would be your first observation to him? <laughs> Um, what, a, what a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, I would, yes, I would say, tell me honestly this. You collected four months supplies for your expedition at the mouth of the Indus River here near Karachi. Were you planning for them to come by boat along the coast 
when you marked into Gudrosia? And was the problem that the winds blew the wrong, the monsoon winds blew the wrong way? Did you have a plan, I think you did, for supplying the army by sea along the coast of what became your defeat? Because as a great Greek historian of our time said to me, Alexander was badly defeated once by the weather. Absolutely. Richard? I think I would like to know what Alexander really took away from his meeting with the naked philosophers at Taxila. <laughs> when, uh, when Dandamis said to him, what is the point of conquering all these places um, when in the end you're just going to end up like me with six feet of ground and wouldn't it be nicer just to sit down and talk to me? And I think Alexander was if not tempted, I think he saw the point. He understood what Dandamis was saying to him. And I'd like to know what he got out of that meeting rather than what Onesicritus tells us he was able to obtain. Please. May I just pick up our fine question about Persia and uh, the, the Persian Ariman legacy? Um, yes, we must remember Alexander invaded. If you submitted, you were honored. Everyone was joined up uh, and you went on as before. If you opposed him or you rebelled, you were killed. Thousands of people were killed. We must never forget that. The tradition, um, very strong in uh, Zoroastrian later texts, that identifies Alexander as Ariman, accuses him of burning the scriptures of the Zoroastrians. This is centuries later, and you have to be careful one explanation by the great W.B. Henning is there were no Zoroastrian texts at the time. And when people said, well, were they? They said Alexander had burned them. But the last point I want to make is that only six years after Alexander, his satrap, Pukestas, who learned Persian, recruited 30,000 Persians to fight with him against the other Macedonians and he gave an enormous banquet modeled on Alexander's below the ruins of Persepolis. And it was all very successful. I have come to suspect something. Many of the excellent Persians may have hated the Achaemenid rulers. The more we know about their methods, their taxation and their behavior, the more I agree with them. And Alexander recruited the Persians into his army, he came to like Persians, naturally. Who couldn't? He came to enjoy the Persian cavalry. My point is, it is not a straight nationalist divide. Yeah, but of course, he had been a conqueror. Yeah. Never forget, he drank too much, and the wars killed a lot of people. Thank you very much indeed. Um, if I met Alexander, I would do what Hamid Akund has um, said. I would pinch him and ask him, are you real? <laughs> so may I, on behalf of the EFT, thank Dr. Richard um, uh, for being here, and also Robin for being here as well, uh, for uh, providing a most enlightening introduction, because I see this as, a, um, uh, uh, as more or less the introduction to tomorrow and the various detailed sessions that we'll be having. But thank you both for being here. And may I ask the audience to give them a standing ovation, which they deserve.